So let's get into it. The last time I preached on hell, I had, a, I had this gentleman come up to the service, or come, um, come up to the front of the stage after the service, like I love people to do. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, I'd love if you come and we have a chance to connect. But this gentleman came up to me after the last time I preached on hell, and he came up to me and he said, um, I just want to let you know, I won't be coming back to peace. And I wasn't connecting the dots. So I just kind of jokingly said, <laughs> was it something I said? And he said, yeah, it was actually. I said, oh. So what, you know, what, what happened? He said, I, I will not stand for a church that uses hell as a scare tactic to get people to become Christians. And I said, well, scare tactic? I was like, man, you, that, that was seriously not my intent today. And he said, I just don't think we should talk about hell. He said, he said, I think we should only focus on God's love because God's love is big enough to win souls to faith in Jesus. I said, man, I, I resonate with your saying we should totally focus on the love of God. It is enormous. It's beautiful. I said, but do you, do you believe in hell? Do you believe it's a real, real place? He said, yeah, I do. But I just think that we should focus on God's love. I said, listen, man, um, if you've been here for any length of time, you know I don't talk about hell on every, at every single message. I said, but... I'm a preacher of the Bible, and the Bible speaks about hell. And, and when we come to a passage that speaks about hell, I'm not, I'm not going to avoid it. I'm like, Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. I mean, how could, if I want to preach like Jesus, how can I avoid the topic of hell? And so I just want you to know, like, when we come to a passage and hell is brought up, we're going to preach on it. And this is the phrase that stuck with me. He said, well, then I am definitely going to find another church. Blessings to you. I mean, blessings to you. Um, today, as we talk about hell, I know that it is uncomfortable at best and absolutely horrifying at worst. And as we talk about the hell today, we, we are going to feel kind of the sobriety, the weight of that in our passage in this sermon series that we've been going through here in October, is we, we've called it haunting, the words of Jesus that scare us. And we're going to talk about the words of Jesus himself. We're going to read a passage today, and it's only the words of Jesus as he talks about hell. So if you have your Bibles tonight, I really hope that you do. Would you please turn to Matthew cha or, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 9. If you're using the Bibles that we have provided, you're welcome to do so. That's on page 1109. We are going to be reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version here today, but I need to take a moment with what precious time I have today, and I have to explain something about our passage. So it says Mark chapter 9, verses 43 to 48, but as you read along with me, you're going to notice that two verses are omitted, verse 44 and verse 46. Now let me explain why, because I think there's sometimes there's some misunderstanding which leads to controversy about this. Verse 44 and verse 46 are verses that you will find in the King James Bible and the New King James Bible. But in other modern translations, you will not find those two verses. And let me explain real, real, quickly, why. real quick, quickly why. So when the King James Bible was translated in the early 1600s, those translators used a set of documents that they had available to them at that time. And those documents, those translations of the Bible dated from around 1200 A.D. So if you do the math, I mean, that's well over a thousand years after what the original, when the original documents were written, the original letters in the, in, the, in the Gospels. But that's what they had at that time. So they translated into English, into the King James English, based on what they had available. That was the early 1600s. Well, fast forward over a hundred years later, in the 1700s, more and more earlier documents began to be discovered and became readily available in Europe. Some of these documents were up to 900 years older than what the King James people used, to trans to trans the King James translators used. 
And these earlier documents that were much closer to the original writings didn't include roughly 16 verses that the King James uses. And so in an effort to to be what we think is more faithful to what the original document said, we have omitted those verses. Now, of those 16 verses, none of them change the theology. None of them change the doctrine that we see taught in Scripture. And in fact, I think it's pretty phenomenal that we're only talking about 16 verses that really don't change anything. Um, And actually, of our passage today, verse 44 and verse 46 say the exact same thing that verse 48 says. So we don't lose anything other than just some words. So that's why that is. I I know I, I love and will preach from the King James. I have nothing against it. We just have to understand um, what we're reading before us. So if you have a problem with that or if you have questions about that, I am more than happy to talk with you further. But today we're going to be reading from the English, English Standard Version. It'll be up on the screen, clicked through, if you don't have a Bible in front of you. But with that, would you hear the word of the Lord, the words of Jesus from Mark chapter 9, starting at verse 43. Jesus says, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with, feet, than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. These are the haunting words of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray, and we'll get to it. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we we come before you right now with humility, with a level of trembleness before us as we think about these very sobering words, these haunting words that your Son, our Savior, has spoken. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would guide my words and you would guide our thoughts today as we receive the words of our Lord. Let your truth give us perspective and a renewed drive for holiness and faithfulness. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. And everyone said, amen and amen. So as we look at this passage today and we look at our topic today of hell, I know almost everyone comes in with some word association. If I said, tell me about hell, there's I, almost everyone in here would be able to say something, whether that was the fire or, or the devil or separation or judgment or wrath, um, pain, and all those have their place. But there's one concept and notion about hell that I think is so often not incorporated into our doctrine of hell. And that is the notion of justice. That hell is a place of justice. Hell is where the rightful punishment for sin is eternally being enacted. That everyone who is in hell rightly deserves to be there. There is no crime committed when a person is thrown into hell. And Jesus is going to tell us why today. So when we talk about hell, we're not talking about anything that violates God's goodness or love or holiness. In fact, it only goes to bolster it. And so I, this is the, I would say this is like the most horrifying, this is the main point today, that, that, that the horror of hell is that it is just. That those who are there deserve to be there. And as we walk through our passage today, verse by verse, we're going to see at least three scary truths about what Jesus teaches us. Here they are. That we have the wrong metric for sin. That we have the wrong motive in life. And we have the wrong mindset about hell. So let's, let's go back and start. We have the wrong metric for sin. Simply put, we don't think our sin is all that bad. In fact, I would say for a lot of us in here, we think that sin is kind of like breaking the speed limit. I mean, like, 
you know, everybody does it. We know we shouldn't, but here's what happens, right? I mean, we see the sign literally in black and white. We know that this is a law. We know we're not supposed to go faster than that. But here's why we do. And here's why we keep going faster than the speed limit. It's because we have ascribed our own metric to why that's the speed limit. We've ascribed our own meaning to this. We say, okay, yeah, I know that this is the speed limit. But I know why that speed limit's there. See, here's why that speed limit's there. It's to keep things orderly. It's to keep me safe. It's to keep other people safe. That's why that speed limit is there. And so what we do then is that we think as long as we don't violate the meaning behind that, we haven't really broken the law, right? So we say like, okay, even though I'm going like 63, 65 miles per hour, I'm not driving recklessly. I'm still orderly. Everyone else is driving this speed limit. It seems to be safe. I'm not hurting anyone by doing this. And so we continue to go faster than the speed limit without remorse or regret. And that's exactly what we do with sin. We know, we know what God has said in the Ten Commandments. We know what God has said in the Bible. We know what Jesus taught us. We see it here literally in black and white. But this is what we do. We ascribe our own meaning to that. We say, I know why God wrote those laws. It's to keep me safe. It's to keep us all pointed in the same direction. And so we ascribe our own meaning to God's laws. And as long as we don't break our own meaning, then we don't feel like we have sinned. We know what God has said about sin, but this is how we determine if something is truly sin. Do other people do it? Yes. Do I feel bad about it? Eh, not really. Did other people get hurt? No. Am I being unsafe? No. So what's the big deal, God? What's the big deal? As long as we don't violate our own meaning to God's law, that we feel like we haven't sinned, and we keep doing it without remorse or regret. And it's because we have ascribed our own metric for sin, and this metric is based off the wrong meaning. We don't care what God has said. We only care about how it makes us feel. And this feeling is based off our own meaning rather than God's explicit commands. We say to ourselves, God has placed these laws in our lives to keep us from sinning because, well, sin must be bad for us. And so we'll say things like this. We'll say, God's commands are more like guardrails. They're there. We know we're not supposed to bump into them, but they're there to keep us safe and keep us all pointed in the same direction. Right? And then, so as long as we don't violate our own ascribed meaning, we think we haven't sinned. Now listen to me. I'm not saying that the guardrail analogy for sin isn't, isn't, is bad. I'm just saying it's not the ultimate meaning. The reason that sin is sin is because God has said that it is. Period. And he is God, we are not, which means he does not have to justify his own laws to us. But the beautiful thing in the midst of this is that we know and we believe that God is good. He is a good God. He is a loving God. He is a just God. So those laws that he's put into our lives, even though we may not always understand them, we can trust and believe that they are good. And they're for our good. But have you fallen into this trap? I'm wondering if you have fallen into this trap. You think that as long as it seems good to me, as long as it's celebrated in our culture, as long as no one else is getting hurt, then it must not be sin. Teenagers and young adults, I'm looking at you too. Have you fallen into that trap? If you have, you are in an incredibly dangerous position. And Jesus says to you in verse 43, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 
It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. Jesus is telling us, hey, don't worry. Don't worry about how it makes you feel. Don't worry about its impact on others just yet. You just look in the mirror at your own life. What is causing you to sin against God's commands, against God's laws? Whatever it is, it needs to be removed. Listen to me, people. You cannot take this serious enough. I don't know how much more graphic or dire of a language Jesus himself has to use to get the message across to us. Maybe the people that you hang around with They cause you to sin. Maybe they need to get cut out of your life. Maybe it's time to step away from that group. Maybe it's the phone in your pocket right now causes you to sin. Parents, too many of you let your kid have a smartphone when you know it's a destructive thing in their life. And for some reason, someone else is Lord of your home and they're allowed to keep it. Some of you say, well, I have to have my phone. It's part of my job. But you know in your heart what it leads you to do. And so let me update this language for us all for a moment. Jesus is saying, if your phone causes you to sin, cut it out. It's better for you to not have a cell phone in this life than to go to hell after a successful business career. Jesus is so clear. The cause of sin needs to be cut out of our lives. And yes, you will look different than the rest of the world because of this. And praise be to God, you're supposed to look different. Whatever it is, I'm not saying your phone does. I'm just saying you look at your own life. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Whatever it is in your life, if it's causing you to sin, remove it at all costs. The cause of sin needs to be cut out of our life. Which leads to the second scary truth is that we have the wrong motive in life. Satan is leading this generation to think everything is about us. And when we think everything is about us, then we can't grasp the idea that God would send us to hell. Why would he send us to hell when everything's about us? We think that sin is what we make it to be. We think that life is all about us. And so when we... Think that, well, if there is a hell, God couldn't possibly send us there, right? I mean, the former generation would have said, that hell's for a place like Hitler. This generation says, hell's a place for, like, capitalists. <laughs> Every generation needs to realize hell is a place for all of us. If you only see sin out there and you don't see it in your own soul, you are in the most dangerous spot in all of eternity right now. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Jesus Christ tells us this. Verse 45. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. How does this work for a culture whose greatest desire is to have a perfect life? Well, how are we supposed to grasp with this? Jesus is telling us <laughs> it's better to hobble through life lame and broken with missing pieces than to be thrown into hell. Did you know that the, the, um, the road to hell, the, the, the road to hell is paved with these special bricks And you know what they are? They're mirrors. And they keep us looking down at ourselves and our wishes and our desires. And we, oh, okay, this is how I want to spend my money. Okay, this is what I want to do with my time. Okay, this is who I want to hang. Okay, this is what I want to do. And we keep our head down looking at ourselves, walking this road to hell. And at some point, Satan just opens the door and lets us walk right in. I'm not saying into hell. I'm saying just a continual path of sin. The road to hell is paved with self-reflecting bricks. And sin is when we follow ourselves 
instead of following our good God who loves us. If your feet make you follow that road, you need to cut them off. It's better to have no feet than to go into hell with both of them. Jesus says it's better to forsake the world and even yourself than to go to hell. But we've changed the metric for sin. We've taken God out of what is right and wrong. We know what he says, but we've put our own meaning in place there. We've made life all about us. We've made sin about what we would decide it is. And so how could this self-centered culture ever believe we deserve hell? This leads to the last scary truth. When we have the wrong metric for sin and we have the wrong motive in life, well, of course, this is going to lead us to have the wrong mindset about hell. So many studies are coming out right now about just everything that's going on in this world because things have just changed so drastically. A big study just came out um, since the year 2000, so about 20 years ago. Every single branch of Christianity has seen a decrease in church membership and church attendance. I'm talking mainline. I'm talking orthodox. I'm talking about Catholic and yes, even churches in our camp, evangelical. Now, you may wrongly sit there and say, well, wait a second, it's because the entire world's becoming more secular. You'd be wrong. In that same time frame, when Christian churches saw a decrease in church attendance and membership, the Jews, the Muslims, and the Baha'i have all seen an increased attendance to their religious services. Christians, we are the ones who are losing our spiritual perspective. Modern people, and there's been so much of it lately, modern people who cry out for justice, they need to face, we need to face, the reality of what we are asking for is more than just a legal social construct. Justice is a spiritual reality. I believe in justice. I want the world to have justice. I want people to be served justice. I mean, other people, not me. I mean, I want to see justice out there. But justice is getting what we deserve. And Jesus Christ himself is telling us that the haunting truth is our sins deserve hell. It's odd. It's odd for me to see a world cry out for justice in a legal sense but at the same time completely deny its spiritual sense. But Jesus doesn't let us off so easily. Jesus gives us very graphic imagery, very graphic imagery about dismemberment and gouging out our own eyes. I mean, just think about this in Jesus' context. He's not talking about some some sanitized operating room. He's saying you take a hatchet and lop it off, blood squirting out and everything. You take your thumbs and you push them in your face till your eyeballs pop out. I'm sorry to get graphic here, but you need to understand the gravity of what Jesus is trying to teach us here. He said that doing that is better than going to hell. The imagery here that Jesus gives us is nothing short of absolute horror. Ever burning, but never dying. Hell is to be avoided at all costs. There is no sin that is worth it. Hell is not little red demons with pitchforks going around poking the damned. Jesus himself tells us what hell is in these short little verses. Jesus says it is horrendous torment. He calls it unquenchable fire. Now, is is hell a place of literal fire? It might be, but every major theologian since at least 600 years ago don't believe that Jesus is is talking about a literal fire. This is a metaphor because there are many metaphors that Jesus uses. All of them are super scary about what hell is. And so when we talk about mixing metaphors, that leads us to believe it's a metaphor. But here's what I would tell you. This shouldn't bring you comfort. If hell is not fire, you would wish that it was. Hell, Jesus says, it's horrendous torment. He calls it unquenchable fire. He says hell is consciously eternal. He says in verse 48, their worm does not die. That is the last 
verse of the book of Isaiah talking about God's judgment. It's horrendous torment. It's consciously eternal. And Jesus says, hell is righteous judgment. God doesn't sit there and say, oh, shucks, another one went to hell. What does it say? It says, we are thrown into there. God, in his righteous justice, puts people there as a consequence for their sin. Horrendous torment, consciously eternal, righteous judgment. Listen to me, my friends. These are not the words of some fire and brimstone street preacher. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. So let me hit on a couple things I think we get wrong about hell. One of the wrong mindsets is that we think the doctrine of hell undermines the love of God. Let me, let me respond to this in two ways. Number one, yes, yes, God is love. But anytime someone says that, one of our first responses should be, yes, God is love, but that's not all he is. He is holy and righteous and good and just. And because he is those things, he will not let sin go un punished. The second way I'd answer this is when you look at all the absolutely horrendous things in this world, it's not loving to let sin go unrecognized or unpunished. It's not loving to let the victims of oppression and abuse think that their abusers will never face justice. They most certainly will. If you have been hurt, hear me, God does not look at your pain and say, oh, well, deal with it. God will bring to account every wrong that's ever been done. God will bring to justice every evildoer in this world because he is love and because he is just. I think one of the other wrong mindsets we have is that we think the doctrine of hell teaches disproportionate punishment. Now, I like this question. I like, I like where we're going here because I think we're on the right track here. We're, we're, we're talking about justice. Yes, crimes and punishments must be proportionate. When someone takes a life, the proportionate punishment is, logically speaking, is life. Either by death or by the rest of your life in jail. Right? We know this, right? That your time in jail should be proportionate to the severity of your crime not the amount of time your crime took. Right? Just because it takes 10 minutes to rob a bank doesn't mean that your punishment should be 10 minutes in jail. Right? You see, here's the problem people have. Why would God send us to an eternity, everlasting, never-ending punishment in hell for, something, for some temporal sin that we did on this side of eternity? Why, why would God do that? Well, that's because it's the most just punishment that there is. Our sin is no innocent thing. But we can't grasp in our heads, we can't wrap our minds around this because we cannot fathom how holy and good and just God is. To, I mean, if, if we had any shadow of an idea of how good and holy and righteous God is, we would understand that any sin against him should result in an eternal consequence but we don't think that because we don't think our sin is that bad of a thing. But let me tell you, Jesus is clear. Our sin is no innocent thing. So we should stop treating it like it is. I don't know how much more dire of a warning Jesus himself can give us. It is scary. It is haunting. And so let me add one more scary truth for this morning as we wrap up. Scary truth number four. Defeating sin and avoiding hell takes drastic action. Now, Jesus metaphorically talks about the mutilation of the human body to stop the onslaught of sin in our lives. Jesus Christ is telling us that defeating sin takes drastic, drastic action. But the good news is, in the midst of this, in the midst of this dark topic, the good news is that Jesus has taken the drastic action that he tells us to. Jesus does take the war against sin all the way. He doesn't just cut off his hand. He doesn't gouge out his eyes. He gives his entire life to stop the reign of sin. 
Jesus gives his entire life to save us from the sin that we do and from the punishment our sins deserve. The Bible says this about Jesus dying on the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, For our sake God made Jesus to be sin, even though Jesus did not sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What the Bible is saying here is that all the wrong that you've done, all the time that you've sinned against God, all the time that you've sinned against others, all the times you sinned when no one was looking, God placed all that sin on Jesus. And then he sent Jesus to the cross and he nailed our sin to the cross and he sat there and he watched it painfully die. As he watched his son die, taking our sin, taking our punishment. God nailed our sin to the cross and he watched it die. And then when he buried Jesus in that tomb, he buried our punishment too. The story doesn't end there. And when Jesus, on the third day, rose again to new life, that's the new life that we get when we place our faith in him. God the Father took drastic action. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but would have eternal life. God took the most drastic action when he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins so that sin might be defeated, so that hell could be avoided. The drastic action that we now take is to repent of our sin, to turn from our sin, and to believe in Jesus, to put our faith in him and what he's done in the power of the cross, the power of the cross to put death to our sin to believe in the power of the resurrection to give us new life and to believe in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to help us to walk into newness of life. Why do we avoid sin? Because God is God and he has told us to. And also, because Jesus already took care of it for us. The doctrine of hell shows us how great our sin is. But it also shows us how great our Savior is. Let's stand and worship him, would you? Would you please pray with me? Father in heaven, you are the God of love and justice and mercy and grace. And Lord, we know that hell and punishment is real, but we also know, Lord, that heaven and grace is real and available to all through the power of your Son. So I pray, Father, here and now, I pray, Lord, that as we place our faith in Jesus, you would bring us to new life. As we turn from our sin, Lord, we turn to faith and we turn to life. Father, we thank you for your Son, our Savior, that by his death and resurrection, we might have life and life to the full and life eternal. We pray that you'd send the Holy Spirit to be with us here and now, that our hearts may believe and our mouths may sing of your praises. To sing. To sing. To sing of the reality that whatever may come, you will hold us fast. We pray these things in the most precious, perfect, and powerful name there is. It's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. And everyone said, amen and amen. Let's sing together, church.